So hello everyone, welcome to this expert interview um, on the topic of 10.9 TMVI and how to optimize patient outcomes. I'm extremely happy to welcome Alison Duncan, who uh, probably has uh, is among those physicians that have most experience and most long-standing experience with this device. So hello, Alison, it's great to have you. And in order not to waste any time, let's get right to it. Um, Alison, so if you had found an ideal patient, you know, who had screened past echo NCT screening, what would be the next steps for you? Okay, so the most important thing to remember about the tendine type patients is that they are uh, a specific group of patients that are similar, but not the same as mitral surgical patients or edge to edge. So they need some really specific workup and periprocedural management. First of all, before they even come to surgery, they need to be receiving optimal guideline directed medical therapy, including CRT. They need to be physically and nutritionally optimized and uvolemic if possible. And when they come into hospital, they need to be volume status managed and their anticoagulation needs to be discontinued. And then there are several phases in the run up to the on the day of the surgery itself that need to be considered. We need excellent communication between the anesthetic, surgical and imaging team. All patients, if possible, should have flotation of a pulmonary arterial catheter to have continuous hemodynamic uh, uh, measurements during the procedure. And really specifically, we need to identify those patients that are at risk of potential complications. And those complications are afterload mismatch, LVOT obstruction or potential LV, complete LV collapse. The sorts of patients we'll be thinking of are, are outlined here, the kind of patients that have got the specific clinical risks, the specific treatments and the avoidance. So for example, a patient with afterload mismatch is a patient with a big ventricle, a poorly functioning ventricle with a cardiac output less than three, cardiac index less than two, particularly worse if they've got a, a coincidental right ventricular dysfunction as well. At the time of tendine implantation, these patients are at risk with removal of mitral regurgitation of relative afterload mismatch and inability, low contractile function. So these patients, you need to discuss in the team brief with the anesthesia team that these patients may need support with dobutamine, some milrinone. You may or may not need to reduce afterload with mechanical support and try to avoid inotropes. So this is about continuous dialogue throughout the, the, the induction and at just at the time of tendine implantation. So before I go on, Alison, you have published a very elegant summary, so to speak, article in the Structural Heart Disease Journal just a few year, year, weeks ago, which um, summarizes what you've been saying and which would serve as an excellent reference for uh, colleagues that would like to read up on this. If we take this further, what would, what would be the key watchouts for you, uh, maybe sequentially during the phases that a patient runs through? Okay, so the... the uh... If you've optimized the patient pre-procedure and you've got them as hemodynamically optimized as possible, the next key stage is obviously implantation of the tendine device. And you, the implant team need to have discussed with the anesthetic team that this is a time where the patient may become relatively hypotensive um, and that injudicious use of inotropes, uh, vasoconstrictors may result in quite a lot of uh, potential really big complications. So it's important to be preemptive, have the patient well filled if you think that they're a patient that's potentially at risk of afterload mismatch with, as I mentioned already, maybe some uh, uh, support in terms of inotropes and dobutamine and milrinone. But the other group of patients that are also really at risk are the patients with LVOT obstruction. So this is multifaceted. We need to explain to the operator to keep their hand up because dropping their hand if they're tired can produce a systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. The anesthetic team needs to keep the patient as well filled as possible. Obviously, we need to try have gone in as posterior as possible to try and avoid uh, an inadvertent anterior access. And of course, we would have identified the patients that are potentially at risk, even despite all of that, of potential neo-LVOT obstruction in the pre-screening. So the patients who've got a relatively small ventricle, hyperdynamic uh, septum, unsupported anterior mitral valve leaflet, narrow aorta mitral angle, and so on. So you should know the patients in advance are at risk of that. And we should have had dialogue, continuous dialogue with all the teams so that at the point of implanting the device, you, you are aware, the whole team of aware is 
Are they going to require afterload mismatch support? Are they going to require prevent pre prevention, further hemodynamic prevention of LVOT obstruction? Okay, very good. And so imagine we had implanted successfully a tendine device. Of course, it's not over yet, right? You will probably like you would you would probably like to have close attention to these, as you say, complex multi morbid morbid patients. How what would you advise for our listeners? So that's great. So at the end of the procedure, just as you're about to finish, of course, you, again, hemodynamic control, we've got to uh, secure apical access, make sure that the patient's apex is, uh, is uh, competent, that there's no tears or repair if required, and to keep the blood pressure around about 130, no more, just to make sure that we can get good hemostasis. And then in the post-operative care is as important as any stage before. So there needs to be a really good handover to the intensive care or high dependency unit, really clear guidelines about optimal hemodynamic control, you know, set hemodynamics uh, measurements in terms of fluid status, cardiac output, because remember even very small changes in, in fluid balance status can really affect these patients in the very initial procedural period. We need to make sure that the patients are, if possible, uh, remove their PA catheter when they're stable, ensure good pain control, make sure that that's done by, you know, either by a paravertebral nerve block, remove the chest drain when the patient is, uh, is not draining anymore, but keep, be alert for re recurrence of a, a pleural effusion, a left pleural effusion. Uh, try to mobilize, extubate as early as possible, mobilize the patient as early as possible, uh, really good control of blood pressure, reinstigate their anticoagulation if, if they've not been anticoagulated before initially start their anticoagulation we're aiming really for an INR around about 2.5 um, in the sort of in the, on day two or when as soon as it's safe to do so and again early echocardiography just to make sure we've got you know what look at the LV function RV function uh, assess the valve make sure that there's no pericardial collection and so on so you know these things are really important in the first sort of week post procedure okay uh, thank you very much Alison I think that was a perfect uh, recap of uh, all basically all stages of this procedure you've taken us through pre peri and post operative care and uh, directed our attention to the uh, clinical key issues and I think what would be my primary learning from this is that 109 TMVI requires extremely close and careful interdisciplinary collaboration, not only between the interventional cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon who are at the key of, or at the core of performing this procedure, but also most importantly with uh, imagers such as the echocardiographer, as well as the anesthetic team. So let me thank you once again, and uh, I hope all of you found this uh, interview informative. Thank you very much, Leonard.